So uh, thanks for coming out. I know there's other competing events if you guys have chosen the right one. Plus you can look out at the old tree here and get supported. Uh, you're going to be shocked, absolutely shocked to hear that I met Eric Miller uh, because of an essay he wrote about me uh, But then, I, after that, I discovered that he has written the definitive biography of one of the most significant intellectuals of the 20th century, whom you may not, you may not have heard of, but he was very important. His name is Christopher Lash. So, uh, I'm not sure that Lash will talk much, much today, but uh, Eric's book on Lash is, is quite remarkable. Um, so, Eric is a historian who is going to talk tonight about poetry, and uh, another thing he's going to do is going to defy disciplinary and uh, political categorization. Is he's going to talk about a populist tradition that has been ignored by the two dominant political parties. So, one of the things that he learned from Lash, even if Lash may not come up much tonight, is the sort of iconoclastic mode of thought that rejects the sort of giving categories uh, and thinks more creatively. Uh, so although these uh, unusual commitments make Eric homeless among our country's uh, major institutions, they shape his lifelong work to be at home in his place, his community, and his religious tradition. Hence, I can think of no one better suited to talk to us tonight about the meaning of place and the responsibilities of citizenship. So please join me for the Eric. Now see the oak tree, which is quite a spectacular oak tree. And I can't tell if that is a tin oak. There are no tree leaves, and I'm only good with the leaf part of the yeah, no. I uh, just got here from uh, Pennsylvania. I live outside of Pittsburgh. Are there any Pennsylvanians here? Is there anybody who's ever been to Pennsylvania here? You've heard of it. All right, okay. We're on the good side. That doesn't mean anything to you, but it'll come up. It's like a sure sign of local sentiment when there's you know, that, that, kind of, that kind of feeling in the air. Um, I teach at Geneva College, which is about 30 miles from Pittsburgh. Uh, I direct an honors program, and uh, I know I have some sense of where you are as students at this point in the semester. I know I think you go a couple weeks longer than we do. In our case, what I think is happening is that our students right now have experienced the death of the semester because I think today is the first day it's been above 50 since about February 25th or something like that. We had this really warm February and then it, uh, so I escaped that moment of the death of the semester when you look into their eyes and they're daring you to teach them one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> you assign reading, you are so dumb. <laughs> Uh, and I did assign a big book, George Packer's on one uh, for the end of the semester in uh, one of our classes. But it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I am really grateful that you come out. I'm going to talk about citizenship and place, and uh, I'm going to do so by talking about the place that I know best, a uh, place that I've been for 19 years now, and that is uh, this town of Beaver Falls. Geneva College has been there since 1881. The college was founded in 1848 by some renegade Presbyterians who were uh, anti-slavery. And um, we actually were part of the Underground Railroad when we moved from Ohio to Pennsylvania. Um, we carried with us this tradition of a kind of love the country, but also work against the country when the country's going in the wrong direction kind of stance. And, and the town that I live in is um, was at one point one of the most prosperous county was the was the, the part of one of the most prosperous counties in the country in the moment of the pinnacle of our industrial power as a, as a, in, in, in steel. Um, the per capita income in Beaver County, I live in a town called Beaver Falls, most famous because once upon a time there was a quarterback named Joe Namath who was very famous who was from Beaver Falls. Um, for you football fans, Joe Namath was the quarterback of the Jets who won the first championship for the American Football League um, before we gave the I think that was the first one. So, uh, but it's a town that had this massive steel industry and the valley that itself along the Ohio River, which runs just eight miles, uh, our river that we're on is, is confluence with the Ohio, is about eight miles from the college. And so all along the rivers, the drain of the Ohio, there were steel industries that employed 
tens of thousands of people and attracted tens of thousands of, of immigrants. Uh, Pittsburgh was one of the places where you could go around uh, the first decades of the 20th century and very easily find pockets where English was rarely spoken. Uh, major cities came into existence that were divided up um, according to the ethnic precinct that they would put the steel workers in and their families. Um, and uh, all of this fell apart around 1980, between 1980 and 1985. Everything just went under. And, uh, and these towns were abandoned, the factories went out of business, and you have uh, all kinds of, of unrest that's followed in their wake, as well as a kind of depression, culturally known as the Rust Belt. Is this considered the Rust Belt? Sort of, a little too far north for the Rust Belt. Um, the Rust Belt, because uh, once upon a time it had all this metal, but now the metal is going the way of, uh, I don't want to set off flesh, but that's a really bad metaphor today, it's in the presence of the English professor. <laughs> Um, so Beaver Falls uh, has become a site where a lot of people, um, that a lot of people have given up on, but it's also become, at the same time, it kind of feels like a ghost town. I, I teach a course in 20th century U.S. history. There's, a black, there's black and white footage of our town from 1937, the Great Depression. Uh, about a half hour long, a filmmaker goes through and just goes from one end of the town to the other, and there's no audio. But he just shows everybody out on the street, and the shops, and all the kids playing outside. And our kids watch it, and their mouths drop, because when they look at it, it looks to them like Beaver Falls is in the opposite state from depression. It looks like it's this thriving, and, it, and, it, and it's a lot of it's just because, yeah, there were kind of, it was, they were doing okay for the depression. There were just a lot of people there, and a lot of shops. Um, and now it kind of has a ghost town feel. But because of this, Ghost Town Fuel, there have been a lot of civic groups that have moved back in um, or that have st stuck around and tried to find a way to come back. And it becomes a nice way to think about this topic of how citizenship requires us to be devoted to places. So um, when we moved there 19 years ago, we, we weren't from Beaver Falls. We, my wife and I were more or less from the east side of Pennsylvania. And we moved most immediately from a place called Paradise uh, in Lancaster County, which is one of the places that is a kind of tourist destination. If you've ever heard of the Amish, uh, the Amish, the oldest Amish community in, in America is in, uh, is in Lancaster County, about 60 miles, 70 miles west of Philadelphia. Has anybody ever read any of the Amish romance novels? Do you dare to admit it? Probably not. Um, but there's a whole genre that's big to find those. <laughs> There's a whole, I know, these Amish romance novels. Um, so when we were looking around for a house there, and we told them we were moving from Lancaster, people would say things like, you're moving from Lancaster to here? We go to Lancaster on vacation, uh, which I knew very well. We lived, uh, we lived in one of the parts that had a lot of tourist attractions. And uh, my favorite bumper sticker in those years was a bumper sticker that said, welcome to Lancaster County, now go home. Uh, the traffic was so bad that you'd have to like maybe these winding detours to take three times as long to get where you wanted to go. Um, but when I left there uh, in 99, we, I had lived there 17 years out of my 32 years in different places. So I did feel like it wasn't quite paradise lost, um, it was paradise left. But we were excited to move. Uh, we got a job in a difficult job market. We had a family. I had family from the western side of the state. I had grown up cheering for Pittsburgh sports teams. I was. A, I had had wonderful memories of those 1970 Steelers teams that won four Super Bowls and the Pirates last World Series when I was in uh, eighth grade, 1979. Um, and so we we came there with a sense of excitement, but we knew almost nothing about it. I had been to, I had gone to seminary in Chicago at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and I played uh, intramural soccer with a guy who had been a student there. So I had this little vision of Geneva College. I had a friend who was a historian who described Beaver Falls as a dim, a grim little town that the Industrial Revolution forgot. And that hurt, but I figured he was from Philadelphia, and that's just the way they were out there. Uh, so, uh, so we moved there without knowing very much, and, uh, 
And we had two faces in those early years that, that I identified with Beaver Falls, and I still do, because they were kind of our first portal into this town. So I'm going to kind of tell you a tale, with apologies to Dickens, a tale of one town um, with, from, two, from two different stories. Um, the first guy's name was Lee. Lee was in his mid-60s and had worked at Geneva College and lived in Beaver Falls during the heart of his, uh, his own professional career. He worked in public relations for Geneva College, raised his family there. He was an elder by this time at our church in Lancaster. And when he heard that I got this uh, job offer at Geneva, his eyes lit up. He practically did a jig, which would have been an accomplishment had he done so. Uh, he and his wife had us over to their house uh, just to show us all the paraphernalia they had from the college and from the town. They described it intimately and all and, and with this detail, what it looked like, what the people were like. They made every possible effort to connect us to people that they knew, to put us in touch with people who might help us with housing. It was this extremely obvious sense of affection and belonging to this town. And that made us feel something. That's a good place to be. Who doesn't want to live someplace that people genuinely want you to live, want you to join? And, um, and he was working as sort of a, a consultant at the time for the college, so I would see him every now and then in those early years, and he'd take me out to meet at, at a favorite restaurant downtown. And I came to feel this immense sense of promise and hope about Beaver Falls, even though it was in this sort of condition of erosion through Lee Trout. Turns out Lee Trout uh, was the father, was the father of our current president, and uh, his son Calvin, who's a communications scholar that taught at the Duquesne University of Pittsburgh for years, came there and has brought that same kind of enthusiasm and a kind of almost a kind of irrational love and irrational or, or super rational um, hope for, for 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 this town and this place. So that's Lee. The second guy is a guy named. Chuck. These guys are both from the silent generation. Lee's now gone. I think that Chuck's still alive. And Chuck's the guy who answered the phone at the real estate office when somebody told us that a house had gone up for sale very close to the college. And he was located in a place called College Hill. It's a, it's a, it's a neighborhood. It's elevated a little bit above the town, just above it. And uh, we were hoping to get a house right, right in the town. It was, a, it was the 90s. And, uh, the market was pretty tough. So we drove out right away. We called the number that was on this sign, and Chuck picked it up, and, uh, and he started to take us into the world of Beaver County through the real estate plan. And he told us all kinds of stories. He was a very grandfatherly guy in a kind of rough, you know, um, practical way. Uh, he told us that Beaver Falls had once been the very center of shopping for the west side of Pittsburgh. If you're going to go shopping west of Pittsburgh, Beaver Falls is the place you go to. I couldn't believe he also said that in those days, this is after World War II, that the pollution was so bad that when you crossed over the Beaver River on a bridge, you had to roll out the windows or hold your nose. So a lot of people had a nostalgia for the old industrialized uh, Beaver Valley, but there were a lot of downsides. Um, he took us around. He showed us a lot of different places. We looked uh, anywhere within 15, 20 miles of the, of the college over several visits. My wife and I had uh, two sons at the time, and our youngest was just about a half a year old, and so he was holding a little baby, and this truck's kind of cradling him, where we're peeking around in the closets and things like that in these houses. He took us all over the place, but one place he would not take us, interestingly enough, was downtown Beaver Falls. Even though there were beautiful old houses downtown, and there was a sense still of a kind of community, he would, he refused, he flat out refused to show us any houses downtown. We knew nothing about the history of the town except for this industrial story that was so obvious. And I think he had the, our best interest at heart. He just said, you don't want to buy there. You're not going to get your money back. The housing market is in a dive. And if you go there there's, uh, and you buy, there's a good chance that when you decide to sell, you're not going to be able to do so. You're really not going to get your money back. And he reminded us, statistically, there was a very good chance that we were, in fact, going to move. And my wife and I didn't disagree. We had no particular reason to make this 
a long-term home. I kind of thought we'd leave within five years. It made good sense to us. We had a whopping $5,000 to make a down payment. I did his college seven out of the previous eight years. Uh, so yeah, we bought a house on a ridge overlooking the town, overlooking the Beaver River. It turns out we have stayed there. We raised our families there, our, our family there, our three sons uh, who are now high school age and up. Uh, and, uh, and it's been a great place to live. So Beaver Falls had a very different sort of image in our minds from Chuck's perspective than it did from Lee's. With Lee, it was a kind of buoyant hopefulness. With Chuck, it was kind of a realism of the, it is what it is school, right? What, what are you gonna do? This is just the way the market is, right? This is what I've come to see in the years since then, this is where we're going to center things, is that for a place to thrive, it's going to need something like both of those two perspectives. You're going to need somebody with a virtue of hope and hopefulness, like we. And you're going to need somebody who's at least tending toward the Chuck side of what we think of as realism, a realism without getting cynical in the process, we're getting resigned in the process. So somehow, we have to find a way to live at this point of tension between our hopes and between the actual world, world that we're in, finding ways to put our hopes into the everyday life that we live through practices, through relationships, through institutions, and through a whole lot of care, commitment, sacrifice, and love, right? So we, on the one hand, hope, Chuck, on the other hand, a kind of realism, both virtues, how can we use these as we try to think about what citizenship requires of us? Um, so, paradise lost, sort of, um, and yet at the same time, a promise of a, of a way to go um, into the future, into a future that has, has citizenship in its part. Um, if you haven't received this handout, raise your hand. I believe that we have some similar here. I'm going to try to think about this question. How do we keep promise and place together? How do we keep promise and place together? A lot of us come from places where we feel like, I'm sure Beaver Falls is far from the only example of this. We feel like the promise of the place is kind of dissipating. That it's just a place that I can't wait to leave. A lot of us when we go to college, this is what we think, right? Like college is my finally, it's my escape hatch, it's my shoot, it's where I start my my, my real life. Um, and yet, interestingly, when we come to college, a lot of us come to feel like maybe the college is actually that same kind of place that I can't wait to leave, that I need to escape from. And, and I hate to say this, but you may just find yourself, if that's been your stand toward your hometown in college, you might may find yourself react in the same way to the next place, right? At some point, we have to make a place and make a place our own, right? So that's what we're gonna think about. Um, it seems the way that I've been describing this, that these two guys, uh, hope on the one hand and realism on the other, it kind of makes it sound like hope is the easy part and the realism is the hard part. And I used to think that was true, but as I've gotten older and I think my vision's gotten a little sharper, I think I've come to see that actually the hope is just as hard. Trying to figure out once you do decide that you're going to try to turn something around, that you're going to do your part to do some good to some place that will have some enduring value, some real fruit, right? That to see the hope, to see the hope, takes some, it takes some, it takes some skill, it takes some wisdom. And then to move on that, yet more. Um, this poem uh, by Maggie Anderson, I think, helps us get into this. Maggie Anderson is from the tri-state region that I've been talking about, West Virginia, Ohio, um, and southwestern Pennsylvania. And she teaches at Kent State, or taught for a long time at Kent State, in, uh, outside of uh, Cleveland, south of Cleveland. But she writes up here about this tri-state region um, that I've been discussing. And I'm, I'm going to read this. She says, sometimes my affection for this place wavers. I'm poised between a vague ambition and loyalty to what I've always loved. 
catch the long inside of my slow boat by warp and anchor drag. But if I imagine seeing this for the last time, this scruff of borders of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, shaped by hills and rivers, by poverty and coal, then I think I could not bear to go. Would grab any stump or tree limb and hold on to dear life. I keep trying to say what I noticed here this morning. There's the evening star riding the purple selvage of the bridges, and the flash shine of the Ohio where men in folding chairs cast their lines out toward the backwash of the barges. There are the river names, the Allegheny, the Nongahela, and the names of the tributaries, Fish Creek, Little Beaver. The town's name for function, Bridgeport, Barton's Fair, or for what the early settlers must have dreamed of, prosperity and amity. Why can't we hold this landscape in our arms? The nettle tangled orchards given up on them, the broken fence posts with their tags of wire, burdock taking over uncut fields, the rusted tipples and the mills. Sometimes I think it's possible to wash away the slag dust from the leaves of sycamores and make them green. The way as a child after lesson and punishment, I used to begin my life again. I'd say a little start to myself, like the referees at races. Then on the same old scratchy car seat, with the same parents on the same road, I could live beyond damage and reproach in a place with such problems like any of the small farms among the wooded hills, like any of the small towns starting up along the rivers. I think Anderson here um, helps us to feel where this sense of promise gets started, where we want to go to look for hope. And what I feel when I look at this poem most keenly is that she really feels connected to the land itself. Right? The, the thing that draws her to it isn't some sort of sense of like, you know, my grandfather worked down there at that school, you know, or, or you know, my, my mother went to that school. Or that kind of, and I'm sure that's all part of it, but there's something even more primal, I think. And it's the sense that I just love this place. I love that tree. I love the way the valleys roll into the rivers. I love the way the farms look in autumn. I love it, I can't explain it, I don't want to explain it, I just know that it's mine. And so this powerful line that I'm sure many of us have felt something like it, even though we've never articulated it this way. Why can't we hold this landscape in our arms? Why can't we hug it? Why can't we get near to it? The, the, you know, the, the, the effect of beauty on us when we're alive, the effect of beauty is to want us to have union with it. Right? Beauty leads to a desire for union. And that's what she's feeling. How can we feel this impossible thing? It's a beautiful thing to feel surrounded by something that you love. And when you feel that, and that primal sense, it's going to lead you, lead you to want to defend it, or else part of you, you know, is going to die. If I do not defend this, a part of me will die. And am I willing to, to accept that? And clearly she says no, even though at the beginning of the poem she says, look, I'm, I'm just as torn as you are. Like, I want to get out of here. I, I feel, she says at the beginning, poised between a vague ambition. I want to become famous. I want to become big. I want to become rich. I want to travel the world. Vague ambition. What do you do when you get there? Who knows? But just let me try. Right? Um, but then, devotion, loyalty to what I call love. I think it starts with that. Are we open to allow ourselves to be participants in the actual physical world that we're part of, the creative world that speaks to us with such powerful sacramental force as we allow it to? So I think it starts there, right? And then she talks about these ideas, right? Um, the town's name for function, Bridgeport, which is a cool little town, actually, that has a great ice cream place called Brewster's. Um, uh, these ideals, prosperity and amity. That is, the earthly love, when you love a place, it leads to this kind of moral aspiration, right? Um, but when you start to see things clearly with love that we're talking about, 
you start to also see the problems with it. Have you ever noticed it's the people who love you the most, who truly love you, who truly love us, who actually can point out the things about us that we need help with? Um, some of you may have heard the British writer G.K. Chesterton who says, uh, has a, in his book, Orthodoxy, I can see that yes, you have heard G.K. Chesterton. In his book, Orthodoxy, uh, has a, a, an unforgettable line uh, where he says, you know, some, says, some people say that love is blind. That's the last thing love is. Love is bound. And the more, the more it is bound, the less it is blind. That is, if you really love something, you see it with devastating clarity for the sake of helping it become more itself. And so, so Anderson in this poem talks about uh, the, the, the things that have gone wrong, right? The broken fence posts with their tags of wire, the rusted tipples in the mills, the dust from the steel, uh, the slag that's all over the trees, right? You, you don't gloss over that. It makes me think of another uh, adage by Chesterton where he says, you know, people talk about history uh, of civilizations as if it's filled with ruins. You know, that you, you go to Greece and you see these great ruins of once magnificent cities. That's not, that's not the story of human history. The story of human history is partially completed projects. Ideals that people aim for and got part of the way to and then just could not quite reach the end. And so we start out with these ideals, amity, prosperity, love, neighborly love, uh, what the colonists aimed for when they came here before you know it, we're fighting the Indians. Um, what do we do about that? How do we see them the promise despite the disappointments that we've had in our own lives and our families, in the towns and the communities that we're part of? Um, so, so she ends the poem. What am I kicking here? I'm kicking the wires there. Right there. Um, she ends the poem by turning it back on herself. Okay? Sometimes I think it's possible to wash away this, to make things new, new okay? to begin life again, to say a little start, go back to the beginning and just try again. And that's really my question. Can we become the kind of people who are willing to start up our little efforts in community, our little efforts in becoming better colleges, better towns, better families, all over again. Do we have the devotion, the character, and the commitment to do that? Well, if we do, if we see a place that has promise, how do we fulfill the promise of the place? I think that the pathway to that is through citizenship. Through citizenship. When we moved to Beaver Falls, one of the things that, uh, <laughs> there are so many funny things. One of the things that's really funny about this area is that when you would ask for directions back in the pre-GPS era, um, and you'd say, you know, like, you needed to get to the mall, and you didn't know how to get there because there were all these valleys that were all over the place, you'd have to go over three different bridges to try to get there, and you'd ask somebody for directions, and they would always say something like, well, you take a left down where the Spotlight 61 used to be. <laughs> Oh, great. I don't know where a Spotlight 61 used to be. In fact, I have no idea what Spotlight 61 even means. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. So then they would, you know, but no one, of course, knew the names of the actual roads or anything like that. So it was this very, very difficult thing to try to figure out how to do. Um, but we heard all kinds of stories about the Beaver Valley that had, that had preceded the one that was failing. And the thing that I most remember is how many people talked about the old ice cream haunts that I used to go to. So I would get so. I would be longing to visit just one of these ice cream places to get one of those Sundays. Um, and a lot of times when people of the grim realist, it is what it is version, when they hear stories like that, they think of that, you know, that curse word, uh, the N word, nostalgia. You know, like, oh, uh, well, you're being nostalgic. Those days will never come back again. And there is a kind of temptation to just kind of rest in a nostalgic frame of mind. But here's the thing. I think that this is true. That if there is going to be a place that's going to deserve, that's going to have promise, right? A place you're going to look at and identify as, has something that you want to start again. Right? I think that you're going to end up linking yourself 
somehow to those real memories and real patterns and real practices and places that come out of that past. That it's going to, it's going to require a kind of self-conscious reconnecting to things that are gone. I have a friend, a uh, colleague, a sociologist who's very involved in community development. One of the things that he and a couple of families have done, amazing to me, is they have bought a building that's downtown that used to house the newspaper that was, that was, um, was put out by Beaver Falls, the News Tribune building, right next to one of Andrew Carnegie's early libraries that he, that he donated. It's been abandoned for decades. They decided to buy it back with their own money, pouring tens of thousands of dollars into it to try to create in that place, in that place that was well known within the community, something important happened there, and it has that kind of smack to it in the area, then try to turn it into a place where they can just attract businesses into it. Okay? They're connecting to the past. They're trying to bring this part of the town to life again. And they're trying to do so in a way that's going to make people remember the past, but not in a nostalgic way. Speaking of Christopher Lash, uh, Lash says that, that nostalgia uh, evokes the past only to bury it alive, because the nostalgic frame of mind, according to Lash, is a kind of frame of mind that thinks that the past is the past and you can never go back. Right? But he contrasts nostalgia to memory. What we really need, Lash believes, is to have a memory that reconnects us to the past in a meaningful way. So that you build on a heritage, you take up a legacy, right? Um, and, so, and so that's what these people are doing. Can we re-inhabit this building? It's not going to be what it is again. The newspaper business is never going to be what it was uh, circa 1950. But the building's there. And maybe things, uh, institutions of civic good can be part of there. It can be part of that same place. So a place with promise to move for that requires this reconnecting through our memory, whether it's our own memories or memories of others that we study and try to understand. And then once we seize on that thing, it needs to be it needs to be um, remembered and cultivated. Then I think we have one question we have to put before ourselves, and that is, am I willing to be the kind of person? who makes a sacrificial commitment to make that happen? Am I willing to step into this void or something that's been filled with things that maybe aren't so good, maybe are downright detrimental, and, and stand there as a witness of another way, doing different kinds of things for the sake of the common good? If those two things are, are in place, then I think we have the chance of what we're going to call citizenship. right? Because citizenship is simply founded on this idea that ordinary people equals, regardless of race, class, gender, ethnicity, religion, can work together for the common good. That we have together as individuals a responsibility for the common good. That we don't look to somebody above us to take care of the good, but we take the initiative ourselves. Right? The, the contrast to citizen and where the language of citizenship came from was in the context of authoritarian rule, where you did not have the responsibility for the common good. You had the responsibility to serve the authority, the tyrant, the king, right? the demagogue, whoever it was. You just showed up and did what you were told to do. Your rights varied depending on who was in charge and what the day of the week was. Right? Um, and that was what Thomas Paine, for instance, so robustly and vigorously opposed when he rallied the colonists in 17, early 1776 with his track Common Sense, which you may have heard of, in which he says that America needs to be an asylum for mankind um, because tyranny is, is, is everywhere abroad, that a republic would be a place where you could go and you could take part, and you could have a say, and you could take responsibility. And so we have this vision coming out of the early, er, the early republic. Ben Franklin uh, does some remarkable things, right? Ben Franklin um, invents a very efficient wood stove. And uh, guess what? He refuses to patent it, to take out a patent. Why does he do that? Because he doesn't want to make money on it. He wants people to have better heated houses. So he makes 
the design of this available to anybody who wants it. Uh, he starts a lending line. Uh, he, he invents the idea for Philadelphia at a time when fires were one of the greatest urban hazards. He starts the idea of a, of a volunteer fire company. Um, trying to work for the, for the public good, what they call civic virtue. That's citizenship. Right? Once you catch that vision of promise in a particular place, and you see yourself as somebody who's willing to sacrifice for that common good, you step into that with the particular gifts that you have to offer. And if you step into that alongside other people of the same ilk, of the same sentiment, the same conviction, something good really can happen. On the other side of the, uh, of the poem, there's a, a quote by the American Anthropologist Margaret Mead. who says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And for Christians, this should bring back echoes from the book of Acts, right? Of a small thing, or what was Christ up to anyway? Those three years training that family of disciples. What was was it premised on? On this idea, I, I think so. Uh, that that if you have enough people devoted to the same ends, that unspeakable goods can happen. Or I should say, unforeseeable goods can take place. But you never know until you get together and you give it a shot. And so I think this quotation gives us a sort of instant inspiration, although it's flagged with warnings, right? Uh, she doesn't say it's a guarantee. They can change the world. Okay? Might not happen. But it's certainly not going to happen if somebody tries it. And it's not going to happen if this doesn't happen. Because what's going to happen in the absence of citizens? Other kinds of powers are going to move in. Because there's going to be a vacuum. Who aren't working with the ideals of citizenship in mind. But are working with the ideals of self-interest in mind. And that can go bad really, really quickly. So with this idea of citizenship, what I'd like to, to suggest is this, that if we make place a point of our devotion, if we set ourselves to move in this direction, and if we do this in the company of committed people, then this dynamic of diverse gifts and talents and abilities and backgrounds is going to surface in, in a way that will have very dynamic and potentially very powerful effect. That is, people like me and people like Chuck and all kinds of varieties between those two poles are going to surface and then you'll see some things begin to happen. Um, so I have a kind of a, a three-part typology of citizenship and I'm wondering if you might be able to think how you are gifted, how you're endowed to be able to fill one of these roles, because I have no doubt of this, that you were made for citizenship. Each of us was. To be a citizen is just another way to say to be a human being. A human being is someone who is made for the other. Uh, we are all a part. The idea of a self-centered human being is actually the idea of someone who's becoming less of a human being. To be human is to become one with but not to become indistinct from. We are made within that oneness through our self-denial, ironically or paradoxically, becoming more ourselves. We become more ourselves through giving ourselves away. So as we decide to give ourselves away, the dynamic of citizenship kicks in and you begin to discover the particular thing that you have to offer. So this is a three-part typology. It doesn't necessarily, I'm sure there's all kinds of other ways to think about this, but this has been kind of helpful for me as I try to think about how to fill the civic space with citizenship. And they all start with F. The first one, the first group, uh, the first sort of orientation of citizenship, I think of as the fillers, the fillers. That is, these are people whose instinct is to fill political and economic space. Political and economic space. Politics, that is, how we live together, how we decide to live together. 
how we rule our lives, how we order things, how we maintain that order, whether we're talking about people who work officially in politics or people who operate in the politics of the, of the particular classroom. There's always a need for somebody to create structure for a place um, and provide that. So people who fill political space or economic space, that is, these are people who help us to, to provide, to, to provision for us uh, the needs that we have for our bodies, um, the, the, the food that we eat, the, the roof over our heads. Fillers are people who are just good at this. Um, there is no such thing as a political and economic vacuum. These are such basic needs for human beings, politics and economics, that there will always be someone in that space. Right? That's why uh, right now um, in, in Rio, for instance, in, in Brazil, um, and over the last six weeks, the Brazilian president has had to send the Brazilian military onto the streets of Rio during the day. Tanks on the streets, soldiers with guns, because there's been so much violence and there's been so much in the aftermath of the Olympics that took place in the World Cup a few years ago. There's been such an upsurge of violence and, and gang warfare over drugs and all kinds of things like this that they, the local police forces are out in. Right? There's always going to be a battle for political space and economic space because they are fundamental needs that people are going to go for. It. Fillers are people who go for that with civic intent, not personal intent, not an intent to gain power, but an intent to make life good for everybody who's there. Right? There's going to be someone in that space who's going to be in it. I have a, a great example of this. Uh, in Beaver County is our YMCA, YMCA of Beaver County, where it turns out four out of five members of my family uh, were, I being the one who doesn't. Three, our three sons have all been lifeguards at the YMCA. My wife now works in member services part-time. Um, it's a pretty big operation. I've been working out there myself for, uh, for about the last six years, and I've got to know a lot of different people. And I realized that it's become a place where you can go and you can talk to people, make friends across religious lines, across racial lines, across political lines. I, one day I was, I, was, I was working out, I was combing my hair in the locker room, and, uh, and to my left, I heard two guys reminiscing about the, the days when their daughters were both, were both members of a swim club um, that, 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 that met in a pretty elite place in, in the county. And the guys on my right were talking about shooting Smith and Wesson. And I thought, that's like red state, blue state right there. I mean, that was just like, um, I, I told somebody which way I was leaning to the 2016 election, and he warned me that if somebody heard that, I'd get beat up before I left the Y. Um, <laughs> it, it never actually happened, by the way. I, I was safe. But there's plenty of people that are diverse and different who just need to keep their bodies healthy. Right? Post-industrial world, we're not doing a whole lot. We're not out riding horses you know, very often. We're not walking a whole lot. We need places like this. YMCA comes in as a nonprofit, fills that space. If that space isn't there, what's going to happen? Where are all the senior citizens going to go? The, 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 the cool kids at the Y where I go are the guys in their 80s. They still argue about their high school football team. They still bet on their high school football team. <laughs> the, the rivalries uh, that they still feel that are so deeply bet, and that's just part of the world. They work together in the steel mills. They served in the, in the military together. They need that place. It's a place that's filled through this organization, and we're better for it. I'm better for it. Right? So the fillers. Um, the second group. Besides, uh, besides the fillers, active fillers, um, I can remember what the second group is. Uh, oh, I forgot this is a break. <laughs> My son Luke, in his senior year of high school, which is one of the Y with me for a semester uh, in the morning, and one of the guys who was a retired engineer, about 80 years old, um, asked him. He knew he was going to go to Geneva, asked him if he knew the college's alma mater. He said no. So he started to teach him the college's alma mater and then quiz him on it afterwards, <laughs> which I thought was, was a, a great vision of this sort of continuity of memory that we've been talking about. OK, the second group, the formers. Formers, which sounds sort of funny. Go with me on this that is people who make it their vocational mission as citizens to form other citizens. 
people who say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make my job to help, you know, little Joey and little Sarah, right, begin to think about themselves not as consumers, right? not as potential celebrities, not as, you know, the next great NBA player, to, you know, to come out of Western Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't think we've had it in a long time. I've had some football players. Um, but no, I, who I am is a citizen. Right? I am going to help form citizens. Uh, and I think about this when I think about the, the youth uh, sports leagues that are all over the place in Western Pennsylvania, and I can them out here too. Uh, and then all the, the dozens and hundreds of coaches who spend their time helping these kids, right, to learn how to shoot the basketball. To learn how to kick a soccer ball. And by doing that, they teach so much else, right? They teach about how to give back to a community. They teach about how to become people who give them themselves for the sake of the goods that are there. I think in our day, in the modern world, sports is one of the true goods that we can celebrate, the kind of innocence that makes us remember things that are hard to, um, that are sometimes hard to remember about, about life in, in our day. Can you become somebody who through Big Brothers and Little and, 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 and that what it's called? Big Brothers and Big Sisters uh, helps form these kids. At Geneva, we have um, we have kids, uh, dozens of our students volunteer for Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and they bring the kids up to the college. I think it's either once a week or once a month in the, in the evening, and the college uh, provides a meal for them, and there's games all over the dining hall. And it's this welding together, an attempt to weld together the community and the college for the sake of for the sake of this common good. Um, teaching kids to read downtown. We have a lot of our students do that at an organization called Tiger Paws. There are some people who are made to do this in a very, very special way. We take it upon themselves, whether it's the way they run their business, they go, maybe go into teaching for this very purpose to try to help us become identified in our own minds and then gain the, the talents and the skills to become people who move into the community. So formers. And then the third group I think of is the framers. The framers are the people who help us to remember everything that I've been talking about. Who frame the world for us in such a way that it jostles with other frameworks that might exist. Those frameworks that say things like, you were made to get out of this town. You know, you were made to know the most exclusive, exclusive pleasure possible by having you know, these goods, these commodities, these drugs. The alternate frameworks of media that are out there. Citizenship too requires people who fight to maintain this kind of, maintain this kind of framework in the minds, in the hearts of the people who are part of their place. Um, and so every town, every place needs institutions that give these framers a chance to do their thing, right? We need newspapers. We need blogs. We need printing presses. I have a friend who's just started, uh, in the last couple years, two, two guys who started a publishing house in Beaver Falls called Falls City Press. And they actually got, because of the civic mission, they got a pretty major book contract maybe before they even had an advertising end, because they did this these authors just wanted to support this, this kind of endeavor, right? We need people who can do this through their poetry, through their songwriting. We need coffee houses right, where people can read their poems or sing their songs um, to help frame the world for us because, strange thing about human beings, we lose our minds so often. They flutter away, right? That's why we need to be reminded. We need to remember. We need to reassemble. The, the, the members of our bodies and our faculties have gone off in different directions. Um, so it may be that your particular talent is to help us to think well about the world. The fundamental task of a framework is to help us to remember what the heck is going on down here and why it matters. And it is amazing how quickly that flees our mind. And it's damning, really. Right? Without frameworks, that's why we go to church, right? To hear the word spoken to us, right? To, to have captured for us again through images, through sacraments. What, 
the thing is that we're really all about, to refresh our memories. We're people who need that refreshment, that remembering. Framers need to do this. Okay, here's the thing. If you start to do these three things, fill this kind of space, uh, four people in these ways have this strong point of view that's made, that I'm trying to make tonight. You know what you're also going to have? Conflict. A lot of conflict. Because people aren't going to agree about what citizenship looks like in any particular instance. And people are going to have different ideas about how to raise children or what should and should not take place in school. I can't imagine that you're any different from Geneva in this community. I'm sure that you have very serious disagreements that are very live about things of intense personal significance to you. This is the way reality is. That reality is one that we have to accept or else we lose the hope of community and we lose the hope of political community, of democracy. If we can't embrace the old adage that iron sharpens iron, and we flee instead from that kind of conflict, then you know what we're going to let open for every, for, for, for you know, wide open? We're going to let those untoward, malignant forces come in to fill the space. Right? Either we find a way to live together and work through our differences and find ways to live with disagreements, but also find ways to live in good faith working toward a common goal and a deeper truth, if we don't do that, we're going to be the victims of it. And worse, our children are going to be the victims of it. Right? The children that you're going to be having within 10 years are going to grow up in a lesser world than the one you're growing up in. So in this, we really have no choice. If we don't do this, if we don't fill the space with good, nothing's going to step in except evil. So that's, I think, the challenge we're in. We are in a tense world. Um, Daniel Rogers wrote uh, an award-winning book a few years ago, a Christian historian, called Age of Fracture. The Age of Fracture. She showed how, from the night which he sees the 1980s on, we have just experienced a series of fractures, even among people who did their very best as communities try to make things work out. It is very, very difficult for us to do this. But that gives us all the more reason, if we love the place, to not abandon it. To not abandon it. When you love something, it's sadness, Chesterton says, is a reason only to love it more. One of the places to become very dear to me, and it took a while for me to learn to love area that I moved into. It was not love at first sight. I love the colonial east where I lived. I love the older buildings. Um, moving to a place that was industrial instead of colonial uh, was a very different landscape um, for me. But I have come to love it. And one of the places where I, my, my love uh, that is kind of kindled the love for my place is a, is a county park. It's about three miles from our house, my Brady's Run Park. It's 2,000 acres. It has two ridges on either side of a beautiful stream that runs through it that's been dammed up, so there's, a, there's, there's fishing and a lake where ducks and, and geese are. Um, there are miles and miles of trails. I have spent hundreds of hours, I think, by now walking those trails. I think I know every square inch of those 2,000 acres on the trail, off the trail. Um, I am very, very grateful for the films who back around 1940 said, we need a county park. We need to have a place where you can, we can take our kids to swim. I love the fact that there's two main trailheads, and about 20 minutes in from each trailhead, there are broken down picnic tables. I've never seen anybody picnicking on those trails. I hardly ever see anybody else on a trail besides me. But I love the fact that sometime, decades past, somebody thought, we should have picnic tables there because people are going to want to take you know, their families or go with their friends on a picnic on it to a park. My life's better because of that. I'm very grateful for the formers 
the people who formed the minds of the people and the characters of the people who decided it would be a good idea to use our money to set aside one. That wasn't obvious, right? That wasn't natural. That only became because that was a value. That was a kind of vision of the sacred that was stressed at some point. And I'm very glad for those framers who made the case for things like that, who made the case against the people who said, don't do that with our tax money, right? or make them pay more, or make them pay to get into the car. Uh, you know. no. We're a better community because we have this common problem, this common problem. I don't need to own 100 acres. I have my little third of an acre, but I have a 2,000 acre park in my backyard that I can go to now, thanks to that decision that people fought for. One of the oldest words in the American political lexicon that is one of the most beautiful, and that's commonwealth. Commonwealth. Think about what that means. That the wealth that we have, the truest wealth that we have, is not the wealth that we have as individuals, it's the wealth that we share. It's things like a park. It's things like a road. Things that we share. The commonwealth is under threat. The idea that there is such a thing as wealth is just not my own to do whatever I want to with. Right? That's an idea that's, 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 that's being rejected around. In Pennsylvania, our state parks are in really bad condition because our money has been taken away from them. And honestly, a lot of people don't go. We become an indoors people. If we can hold on to that vision of commonwealth, Pennsylvania is actually called a commonwealth, the state of Virginia, Massachusetts, we are formally commonwealth. If we can take that ideal and live with it, I think there's just a chance that we can start to see the particular places in which we live as places of promise. And we can start to look towards those little towns and villages and hamlets and neighborhoods where we live with small parts of big cities or little towns and rural counties is places that need our love, our fact, affection, and just maybe they'll start up again, as Maggie just said, it's like those little places along the river, places of family and prosperity. Thank you. to you who will start to talk to you about the place. 
he decided to do a community garden. Right? And, uh, and there's a plot of land in the, in the town you know, that you can start. And you start to, you know, you start to do this kind of work, or you, people are going to ask you what's going on. People are going to maybe be quizzical, maybe a little surprised. But they're going to they're going to try to talk to you about oh yeah so and so you was really into gardening so I think it starts but there's no there, there's no shortcut to that that's just that devotion to loyalty I think we you know we, we stay fixed and it comes to us yeah. anybody else any questions thoughts pushbacks. Thanks, Marsha. Thank you. Thank you.